This video will be part two of my coverage of relational cultural theory for PSY 230 personality theory. Where we left off last time, we kind of laid out the history and the basic assumptions that underlie um, what became relational cultural theory, primarily produced out of the Stone Center model, following the work of people like Jane Becker Miller, um, Irene Stiver, and so on. Now we're going to move into, um, we have a couple of, of big issues to, 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 to talk about here. And one of those is making clear that we understand the difference between the way these theorists talk about the self and the way traditional theorists, such as, as the ones we've covered so far, identify the self. The, the traditional definition of self or ego in personality theorizing, especially the models coming out of, of Western Europe um, and those models that were imported into the United States from Western Europe early on in the history of personality theory, they, they have a very similar way of envisioning the self and the development of the self. Um, the, the first kind of basic idea about defining ego or self or identity as when we study Erickson um, will transition to that language. The self is defined as autonomous, meaning it, it can function on its own. So when we're healthy, the assumption is that we have a self that can stand independent of other elements. Of self. What that means is this autonomous, independent self is, under ideal circumstances, able to be its own kind of freestanding entity. It is the, the house of consciousness and awareness, and it views the external world and interprets the external world. So the idea of autonomy is, is critical. The second element is that it is well-bounded. So healthy self, healthy ego, in traditional Western psychology models, is, is um, a non-porous thing. So by boundary, what we mean by the self is that you have your identity, I have my identity, and the two do not um, intersect one another. Now, think about the context of a, of a tight, intimate relationship, either um, a love relationship between partners or, say, a best friend relationship or a very deep, intimate relationship between siblings, for example. Um, Imagine if the self, when defined as healthy, is boundaried, that intimacy has limits. That means that you have aspects of you, uh, and in fact, in the traditional model, you are a, a, a complete mystery to this other person, despite the fact that you know them, this other person well, and they know, know you well. They only know what you give them. So there's this sense of boundariedness, <clears throat> um, and lack of porosity, uh, you, you don't have those shared senses of identity and overlap. And in fact, that overlap, that shared sense of identity, is pathologized in traditional models. There's also an assumption that who you are, your identity, is um, deeply boundaried from the context in which you find yourself. So traditional personality models have tended to de-emphasize um, the role of the cultural context um, and the historical context on the way the self is expressed, and instead opt for a more reductionist, almost biologically based model. Um, even theorists like Karen Horney and later Eric Erickson, who, who talk about the role of culture and the role of the social context, they don't do much to redefine self in that, in that theoretical, in light of that theoretical argument, um, they they stick pretty close to the traditional model of a bounded independent self. Um, there's also an assumption developmentally that, uh, and this is like the side of cognitive development that emerged out of that very traditional vision of the self, is that over the course of development, people move. In steadily in the direction of greater um, use of logic, greater use of um, intellectual 
uh, thought, um, and therefore, you know, using that logic and intellectual ability to demonstrate self-sufficiency. So there's a real strong um, sense of pathologizing dependency and connectedness. So needing someone is seen as flawed. Um, wanting to be with others and needing to be with others is seen as flawed. So then what's the role of relationships in this traditional view of the self? It's something you choose to do after you have established your independent, autonomous, firmly boundaried self. Relationships are almost seen as a threat to that independence and a threat to that boundedness. People are assumed to be neurotic if their boundaries are weak, if their sense of self is interdependent. Um, and, and it's assumed that you are losing your logical ability to see the world for what it is if you lose those boundaries and some of that autonomy. Now, the relational cultural theorists reject this version of the self. They think, in fact, that that version of the self is deeply problematic in an emotional sense, in a psychological sense, it's flawed developmentally and otherwise. So they define the healthy self as a self in relation. Um, and you know, I've, I've said this before with other lectures, I'm a very visual thinker. I found this image um, on a uh, relational cultural discussion site where you have the self, and the self is defined in terms of connections to multiple significant other people. Now you could take this image and put you, your image in the middle, and then have different significant people in your life in these other bubbles. And think about the way in which your relationship to those others has helped to define and redefine and develop who you are and who you exist as in your life. You know, think about how all of those relationships to others, they can be current relationships, past relationships, even imagined relationships that you haven't had yet, that influence the way you see yourself and the way you move through the world. So instead of focusing on this very self-contained, strongly boundaried self, um, the emphasis is on the fact that we don't live our lives in that boundary way. It, not typically. We typically have networks of connections to people. Sometimes whether we want them or not, but they're there. And we, what these theorists argue is that you can't deny the fact that we, as your authors put it, that we, we have this relational emergence. Um, human experience is in a relational context and to deny that and argue that healthy personality involves protecting yourself from relationships from some supposedly dangerous things relationships can do to you um, is flawed and she argued that it creates pathology to define um, the self in that you know very hyper independent um, and boundaried way they argue further that relating is, when it's done in a healthy way, involves this mutual movement um, where the people who are engaging, if they're engaging in a healthy, mutually uh, responsive relation, relationship, there's a this ongoing way in which there's, you know, a, a constant um, mutual development where if you're showing empathy and responsiveness to another person, that validates their own experience of themselves. When they show you the same, it validates your experience of yourself. In that context, people grow, they mature, and they, they can be more fully capable in a world that is defined by relationships anyway. So they, they argue that this is more common in the experiences of women. They also argue it's more common in the experiences of other disenfranchised groups. Uh, people who don't have access to a great deal of power, they tend to be more relationally organized in the way they experience themselves and other people. 
Um, and, and these theorists are going to argue that's actually a more healthy, more well-adjusted way to live your life. Relational development, therefore, is going to be the center of the way cultural relational theorists are going to describe the self. Um, so instead of assuming that over the course of early childhood development, the whole mission of development is to separate and become independent, um, here relationships become a pathway for self-discovery and identification of self. Relationships are not seen as a barrier to that process, but as a pathway for it. Um, and, and independence in and of itself is redefined in this context, where relationships are seen as empowering as opposed to disempowering. Empathy is, it plays an incredibly important role in these theories. Um, you'll hear or you'll read in your chapter about mutual empathic interplay. Um, so empathy is a really important construct for relational cultural theorists. They talk about empathy um, as a very complicated, although at the same time, you know, I think most of us know intuitively what empathy means, but it has a thought component, it has a cognitive component, and it has an emotional component. You know, the thought component involved in empathy is you in your head thinking about another person in their context and it, intuiting what it is that they're experiencing and simultaneously feeling some of the emotion that they are experiencing in that moment. So for example, one of my close friends uh, just yesterday had to um, have her only two and a half year old dog uh, put to sleep because it was discovered she had chronic, uh, a, you know, a congenital kidney disorder that was killing her. She was broken hearted, um, crying on the phone, um, just desperately sad. So what, what happens there is in my head, I imagine what that situation, I love dogs. I have my own dog. What would it be like for me to feel that? I would be deeply in pain. And I feel some of that, not directly because it's not my dog that's died, but I know what it's like and I can imagine what it's like. That is empathy. So it's, your authors describe it as a complex cognitive affective ability. That word ability matters here. We have to learn empathy um, because it requires that you be able to put yourself in another person's pers uh, point. It, it involves you taking the point of view of another person, but also connecting to them emotionally. There is a motivational component to it. You have to want to know what another person is feeling and there's a vulnerability to it um, you know think about the last time you became emotional whether it was laughing with joy or maybe becoming weepy when you watched a, a really good movie um, or a tv episode or even a commercial for that matter you have to be motivated to open yourself to that and that's part of the model here is that People are at their best when they are capable of empathy, when they are empathetically engaged and interested in other people's feelings. There's also a perceptual component. Um, you have to be able to pull in and make sense of the, the verbal and nonverbal cues that human beings give that give you an open door to kind of see where their emotions are at. Um, you know, in, in the case of my friend and her phone call to me, uh, it was obvious that she was in emotional distress. Other times, you're just not quite sure. Maybe someone looks a little tired, a little frayed at the edges. Um, and you, you start to feel a little concerned about where they're at in their, in their heads. Or maybe you see someone and they just seem overjoyed. So you ask the question, you seem overjoyed. What's going on there? You know, so we have to be able to perceive what's there. Um, and then there's, there's also the, this, the raw emotion component. Um, human beings, uh, along with a very short list of other species, appear to have evolved the capacity to, um, feel emotions in concert with others. Um, 
from a neurological standpoint, all three components, the motivational, the perceptual, and the affective, appear to have a neurological basis. Um, we have specific kinds of neurons that make it possible for us to have similar experiences at a brain level when we perceive emotion in others. Um, when we are motivated to inquire, when we are motivated to search for this information, those brain areas tend to light up um, because we're, we're actively seeking it. Now, there, there's an evolutionary reason to this. Empathy is protective. When you are able to get into the emotional headspace of others, you have the ability to predict and understand their behavior. Um, if you, for instance, can intuit that another person is really, really mad at you, that's a good cue that, you know, either you have to take combat stance or you need to move away. Um, if you are intuiting that another person is deeply sad, that's a different set of cues and so on. Now, we also have to add in here the cognitive component. And, and again, we have evidence that as a species, we've evolved this capacity to then make attribution. We have to make judgments about why people are feeling what they're feeling. Um, when we do empathy work well, what we're doing is asking a lot of questions and validating other people's emotions and their experiences while we seek information and deeper understanding. Empathy is really what drives human connections. Um, and, you know, as I, I said, human beings appear to have evolved the capacity for empathy as a part of their, uh, as a part of our species. And it is a key element in our ability to live communally and successfully as a species. Now, for the relational cultural theorists, they talk about connection in terms of this concept of mutuality. So healthy relationships have this quality of mutuality, um, and it requires a certain degree of being willing to and open to people's potential for growth, their potential for change. Um, so they're going to argue that there's a very specific kind of healthy relationship that fosters emotional growth and development for all people involved in that relationship. Regardless of whether you're talking about a therapist-client relationship or a husband-wife relationship um, or, you know, if you're talking about a stereotypical, um, not stereotypical, a traditional um, intimate relationship or any other kind of relationship, it could be a sibling relationship, friend relationship, uh, a boss and employee relationship, those relationships are healthiest when the people engaged in them are open to change and growth and they see themselves as a part of the change and growth with all those in their interaction circles. The focus here, and they, they use this word movement a lot in, in this theory, they, they talk about the idea that you're constantly in motion in your relationships. Um, so your sense of self is always in a constant state of development, you know, in contrast to kind of the Freudian assumption that you you develop across childhood and then it's relatively static. There's not much happening after that. Um, and Erickson's model that we'll see coming up soon, once you, you move beyond these crises, backwards isn't really part of the thought process there. These theorists, in contrast, say that you're constantly moving in your relationships. You're constantly changing and developing because you're constantly exposed to a world that is not static. Um, and your relationships need to, to be flexible within that context. So there is a, a strong focus on um, movement within the relationship and that movement takes the form of evolving connections. That's going to then have an impact on how yourself is expressed. So to define it, connection is defined in terms of how we experience relating to other people. Um, you as an individual can define yourself in terms of your connections. You can also think about the degree to which interactions are beneficial or harmful to you. 
And you can kind of extrapolate from that, you know, what kind of connections are authentic and growth promoting? What kind of connections are inauthentic and not growth promoting? Healthy dependent, healthy development is going to require this kind of connection. So they're arguing that separation and independence is actually not growth promoting. Connection in a healthy form is growth promoting. What are the two characteristics of healthy uh, connections? Mutual empathy. So the parties involved in the relationship are attuned to each other and can empathize with each other's position and situation. Um, it doesn't mean a complete suspension of judgment of any kind, but it means putting yourself in that very vulnerable position of saying, I am open to who you are, what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, and I will acknowledge and validate your perceptions of your reality and you're going to give me the same openness. And then the mutual empowerment piece in healthy connections is the idea that, you know, once I see you in that real sense of seeing another person with empathy in your eyes, is that you're going to support that person's development as they support your development. The assumption is that doing these two things showing mutual empathy and getting it in return, showing mutual empowerment um, is the energy that drives personality functioning and personality development. So this energy pushes people to feel like they can act, to know themselves well, to feel close, that's the intimacy piece, and to feel strong and worthy in their relationships. You know how it is, if you have a relationship with another person where you, you feel they know you, they see you, they understand and value you, and that when you connect with them, you feel energized, you feel understood, and simultaneously you feel you understand and see that other person and validate their experiences, those are relationships that are routinely described by people as the most important relationships in their lives because they are deeply connected. So how do these theorists up think about psychological growth? They think about it in terms of how people respond to each other. Healthy psychological growth is when you're treated to, for the most part, a lot of mutual empathy and empowerment. Um, and they refer to this concept of mutual empathic interplay between partners. You know, sometimes you're the one who right in the moment really needs a lot of support and you get a lot of mutual empathy and empowerment from someone with whom you are interacting. Other times you're on the, the end of providing the empathy and the growth for the other. Um, so it's, it's interplay. It's a dance that people have to engage in. And it may not always be the same person with whom you're having connections. You can have a connection that's fleeting and brief and it doesn't involve someone you even know, but you're connecting in a meaningful, empathetic, and growth-promoting way. Um, so even those experiences matter a great deal. So what's critical for healthy psychological growth and development is being having the opportunity to engage with others who can show you empathy and who can show you that they are there to empower you. Um, and by doing that, by having that in childhood, you learn to do the same for others. Um, and, you know, for, for these theorists, that is far more health promoting than separation and independence, because what are you learning in an independence and separateness model? You're learning how to dominate other people or you're learning how to be submissive. And these theorists think that that's unhealthy, both of those roles that are so forced upon, particularly for, you know, they these are feminist theorists. They felt that women were often pigeonholed into a submissive role and adjusting to it meant showing psychopathic, psychopathological traits and I don't mean that in the sense of a psychopath like serial killer. I mean the, the experience of negative psychological outcomes like 
anxiety and depression and so on and self-harm for example um, so being pigeonholed into either the dominant pattern which tends to be masculinized or the submissive pattern which tends to be feminized both of those outcomes are a result of disconnection they're a result of not having mutual empathic interplay as a part of your developmental experience therefore you don't learn how to use it with other people Therefore, your relationships with other people will be characterized by repeated disconnection. A little more about this interplay, and this comes from Jean Baker Miller. Um, and, and I've given you the long quotes here. Make sure that when you're reading that you, you familiarize yourself with these ideas because I think they're really important. Um, Miller talked about feeling connected to others as an energizing experience. So when we have mutual empathic interplay with others, we come away from our interactions with them, not exhausted, but filled with energy. Um, and that means, you know, feeling um, a deeper sense of connection. The fact that there's energy there and the energy is perceived positively, because I know you've had the experience of you're having an interaction with someone and you walk away from that interaction absolutely exhausted or angry or anxious and unsettled. Those are our energy sapping emotions. Um, when we feel deep connection to others that are mutually empathic with us, we tend to feel um, energized. And that energy, Jean Baker Miller thought, was a signal that this is a growth possibility. This relationship has growth potential for you. When you are experiencing mutual empathic interplay, you're experiencing active involvement in the relationship itself. And the people in that relationship feel empowered. They feel open to take risks and to grow beyond that relationship. Um, in, in mutually empathic relationships, you also have people who feel like they know each other, know, they know themselves better after their encounters with each other. So as opposed to, you know, a, a version of relationships where people are pigeonholed into roles where one is more dominant and the other more dependent, um, you don't come away with the relation from those interactions knowing any more about yourself other than did the interaction confirm my role status? Um, you're not really showing development within that context. So um, mutual empathic interplay means really getting rid of those stereotypical assumptions and allowing people to grow without the boxing and pigeonholing. When mutual empathic interplay occurs, it tends to drive up individual self-worth. So when you feel heard, and you know this from your own experiences, when you feel like somebody truly gets you and understands you and values you in, in your whole, even when you're at your worst, it, it allows you to feel better about who you are. It, it allows you to feel, even when you're at your worst, that you, you still have self-worth. Um, as a result, you want more connection with that person. Um, now, from the Freudian point of view, or you know, from the, the Western version of the self point of view, this idea that you would have connections that are deep enough to be mutually empathic was often pathologized. It was seen as promoting dependency, promoting um, a, a non-intellectual form of growth and development, where you need to feel self-worth because of what you accomplish, not because of the fact that you are being validated emotionally by another person. So it, it, it's a very masculine Western culture model that these theorists like Jean Baker Miller are directly challenging. So disconnection, as I've mentioned, disconnection is for these theorists the root of um, psychopathology, of uh, neurotic functioning. Um, we're going to grow ineffectively, inappropriately, if we're treated persistently to disconnected relationships. Um, disconnection happens when people are either blocked from 
relationships that involve responsiveness, mutual responsiveness, um, or when their role definition is so restrictive that they can't participate in mutually enhancing relationships. Now, they argue that, you know, strongly gender normed interactions have tended to push people in the direction of relationships characterized by disconnection, um, really strongly characterized by disconnection. So the traditional sort of gender model of having dominant masculine person paired with a feminine dependent um, person who does most of the empathy work but doesn't get it in return it is you know at, on its face a disconnected relationship he also argued that some of the traditional psychological model which expects children to move steadily in the direction of separation and independence actually forces children to move away from a natural um, tendency toward connection and instead to become hyper self-reliant and competitive in nature. A disconnection can take the form of overt abuse um, and neglect, um, but it's oft often much more um, hidden and normative than that. Um, they argue that a lot of the, the ways in which, you know, most of these theorists were American, most of the way in which we've been taught to engage in interactions with our kids has been characterized by um, not so subtle uh, demands that our kids be freestanding and independent and self-reliant earlier than is po probably developmentally appropriate. So these theorists are going to say that constantly pushing kids, pushing kids, pushing kids towards success, pushing them toward competition, pushing them to have independent control over their bodies at an early age, um, puts them at a at psychological risk because it takes energy away from nurturing the capacity toward empathy and understanding and mutual empathic interplay. What this does is set, sets people up um, where they, they are persistently not responded to or where their boundaries are persistently violated. Um, that can lead to isolation, it can lead to depression, it can lead to fearfulness, it can lead to a whole host of problems, which were the typical problems that they were see seeing in the clients that they were working with, particularly women and people from other um, uh, identities that were not seen as being in power. Now, what happens to people when they're repeatedly disconnected, um, when they're exposed? And this is not just in childhood, it's in your adulthood as well. When you are constantly exposed to repeated disconnection in a relationship, um, that experience can damage your definition of self. Um, and, and it can redefine how you're looking at relationships. You know, you probably use the phrase, in describing someone you know, this person has trust issues. Um, well, that that kind of commonly used phrase, it, it hits here, why does someone have trust issues? Well, you develop trust issues because you've been repeatedly treated in a way that proves that trusting others is unreliable, that you're going to get hurt in those experiences. So re repeatedly not getting the kind of mutuality that they argue is required for human growth and development is going to lead you to hyper need for independence, um, an intense desire for boundaries, and a lack of ability to show empathy and mutual support to others. Repeated disconnection can also, and this echoes something that Karen Horn and I argued, in her description of self-idealization as a solution to the pressures of, of social norms and expectations. Repeated disconnection leads people to create a version of self that they think will get them more of what they might need in their world. So if you take traditional gender roles for relationships, we tend to push 
boys and men in the direction of a masculine model of dominance and control um, and mastery. We also tend to uh, socialize girls and women to take responsibility for the emotional labor within relationships. We have been, you know, in American culture, kind of pushing girls and women toward um, this hybrid model of being competitive and strong and independent, but at the same time, emotional and um, loving and connected, while simultaneously not giving them that back in return. So repeated disconnection experiences like that can create a false sense of self of what you need to be in order to be seen as worthy. Um, and they argue that obviously that's going to create mental health problems. What happens when, and this is very similar to what Karen Horn I argued, if you create this ideal self that you think is going to be more acceptable to other people, you're denying aspects of what you could be um, and over controlling what would be your authentic self. Um, people at their best are open and capable of mutual empathy and mutual empowerment. When people struggle to fit a mold that is defined by their culture about what they should be, how they should behave, and how they should feel, if you're going to live up to that set of expectations, you're going to have to shut down um, that openness and engage in a whole lot of play acting, which is exhausting, right? It, it doesn't feel energizing. It feels exhausting having to pass all day, right? So um, that's what repeated disconnection experiences do to people. Now, what are some of the, the consequences more specifically? Um, disconnection tends to be associated with the experience of feeling isolated, feeling lonely, and feeling stuck, um, and feeling like it's your own fault that you're stuck where you are. So self-blame can take the form of feeling like your self-esteem is low, you don't, you aren't worthy of relationships because you're not getting what you need from them, and so on. It can also, um, in these theorists' opinion, lead to experiences of, of anxiety and sadness um, that are due to these repeated disconnection experiences. Sometimes people experience what they describe as complete disconnection. And that can mean um, the person, it, it's kind of like Horneye's resigned solution, where you're just resigning from relation, relationships entirely because they're painful, they have bad outcomes, they have routinely resulted in this disconnected experience. I'm just not doing them anymore. There is a dual tension. Um, being open is risky, and it feels risky, especially when you've been met with disconnections on a regular basis. So there's pressure toward connection because you don't want to be alone. You don't want to be isolated. You don't want to feel sad and self-blame all the time. So your, your tendency as a natural human um, motive or motivational pattern is to connect with others, is to be with others. If, a, if you've seen anything about, you know, all of us living in this pandemic reality, is we're desperate for human contact. <laughs> and, you know, Zoom calls aren't enough. They're just not enough. Um, so we feel pressure toward connection. At the same time, though, we feel a need for separation. And these two things can, can create conflict. So if you've had these experiences, dis disconnections, and they argue that in a cultural context where certain patterns of behavior are not valued in people, like Extreme masculinity tends to push empathy-related behaviors, connection-related behaviors to the back burner for males. Extreme femininity tends to push um, independence and self-reliance to the back burner for females. That tends to say, you know, I should retreat to those roles because they get me rewarded in my world. So there's a simultaneous pressure to disconnect. Um, because efforts at connection that's genuine have sometimes been punished in your world. 
So there's a simultaneous tug and pull between connection and disconnection. And that's what these theorists call a connection-disconnection paradox. So the conflict that really underlies this entire theoretical perspective is um, that you're pressured to connect, but the types of relationships you're most likely to encounter are flawed and they're inauthentic. That then punishes you, so you're pushed to disconnect. So you're in this constant back and forth in a world that tends to foster inauthentic relationships and not prepare people to have the kind of openness and empathy that's required for authentic relationships. Connecting in inauthentic ways means that more and more aspects of the self get suppressed and hidden. Um, again, this is a commonality that these theorists have with Karen Hornei's description of self-idealization. Over time, if this continues to occur, if people have enough repeated disconnections um, and they become habituated to it, they move farther and farther away from their own authentic experience, which means they lose any capacity they had to offer empathy to others and to offer mutual empowerment to others. They also start to lose the capacity to be open to their own experiences. When we are motivated to, to authentically connect, so, you know, the process of therapy often involves teaching people what authentic connection should look like um, by modeling it within the therapeutic relationship. So you're, you're teaching people what an authentic connection might feel like and how to engage in mutual empathy and mutual empowerment that, that can turn people around. Um, so, it, but it still can be difficult when the people around you mostly want the surface. They they want to remain emotionally unavailable, which is what that hyper-bounded, separate, independent self looks like. Um, but it's going to be deeply unsatisfying for you from a developmental standpoint. What what may happen, you know, in the face of this connection-disconnection paradox, particularly in a cultural context that doesn't value um, authentic relationships that are characterized by mutual empathy and mutual empowerment, they may choose the safer path, which is these restrictively defined um, roles that people are expected to play, which means they're going to, because of the roles that they are playing, they're constantly exposed to dis disempowering relationships. These repeated disconnections then lead to the outcomes we've already talked about. Psychological problems, therefore, are going to be defined by these theorists as defense mechanisms that prevent the person, make it difficult for the person to recognize authentic connection when it's offered to them and to seek authentic connection from people who are open to it. That's essentially the paradox. So people may be conditioned to feel more comfortable in inauthentic relationships. They may fear authentic relationships because they are a threat to that, that very deeply enculturated model of what they're supposed to be and who they're supposed to be. So they may, may feel pressured toward the in, inauthentic, but at the same time, they're suffering emotionally because of it. The family conditions that tend to prompt this, um, these theorists, you know, if you, if you read their books, you'll get a lot more specific information about the family conditions, but generally speaking, um, when children are exposed to non-responsiveness, when parents are authoritarian, or when they are permissive, they tend to learn that the only way to, to make some kind of connection is to do so in inauthentic ways. So perhaps by becoming a representation of what's idealized and you know, that's very consistent with Karen Horney's description as well. It, and children who grow up in that kind of context, that tends to be anxiety provoking. So what you end up with is a child who is um, anxiety driven as opposed to connection driven um, in attempting to uh, have a relationship with adults or siblings or friends who seem to have a mysterious set of standards for them.
So again, they're driven by anxiety as opposed to being driven by connection. Some things within families that, you know, the obvious, if there's substance abuse in the family, um, that can lead to people being emotionally unavailable to their children. When there's emotional, uh, physical, sexual abuse in the family, uh, obviously that's a toxic form of connection that is going to be disconnecting. When children are neglected or ignored, um, or if they're just basically not responsive, meaning they're not showing um, awareness and empathy in their interactions with their kids. Um, when you're persistently told that your emotions are not valid, that you shouldn't feel what you're feeling or that what you're feeling is stupid, that's a persistent lack of empathy. Um, other kinds of losses and traumas, including the experience of sexism, the experience of racism, the experience of a culture, a culture of violence, for example, can all lead to repeated experiences of disconnection. Psychotherapy in this model, as I've mentioned before, the, these theorists, um, the, especially the Stone Center theor theorists, tended to focus on issues like anxiety and depression, um, addiction, even um, self-harm, though it wasn't described as that at the time, <clears throat> but also dissociative issues and personality disorders. The therapy requires, unlike the traditional early um, versions of psychoanalysis, mutuality is assumed. So the therapist is assumed to be the, the dominant, in the dominant role of, I know more than you, and I'm going to tell you what you should be feeling and why you're feeling it. Um, instead, therapy creates a safe space where people can experience open, um, mutual connections. So it, it, a lot of it involves, you know, modeling. How can I have an authentic con connection with another human being when my world has so often treated me to disconnection? So what happens in therapy, instead of the more um, pedantic approach of, I'm going to interpret you, I'm going to dig around in your past and discover your traumas, then I'm going to interpret them for you, and then I'm going to tell you why you're being defensive, and we're going to try and shape you into a less defensive form of behavior. Here, instead, the therapist spends a great deal of time showing empathy for the client in an authentic, engaged way, and encouraging the client to show that back, um, of being able to mutually empathically engage. Showing them connection in an authentic way can increase their self-worth and their empowerment in order to take the next steps that they need to develop mentally. So that concludes my coverage of relational cultural theory.